Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate you watching our broadcast, and I trust you've got a few moments to just relax and enjoy today's program. You know, normally we're in an audience or in the studio with a live audience, but we decided that we wanted to change things up somewhat, and I'm going to take you into a meeting where I was preaching a message entitled, Visitations, Manifestations, and Demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. This was taken place in the Kenneth Copeland Southwest Believers Convention last year. Such a powerful message, we felt that it was important that you, our television viewing audience, see these messages, knowing that all of you weren't in that convention. You know, one of the reasons why it's so important that we experience visitations, manifestations, and demonstrations from the Holy Spirit is because of the kind of world we live in today. The world we live in today has become more perverted than at any other time I've ever known. I've been in this for 47 years, and I've never seen such perversion. I've never seen uh, such evil, such sin, you know, things that used to be in the closet are open now. And it seems like, just like the Bible said, people are inventing new ways to sin. Well, we got to keep preaching the word, that's for sure. But we also need signs, wonders, and miracles, because that's what gets the attention of a lost world. And so God is ready to show us manifestations and demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to take you back into that meeting. I want you to watch and be prepared to receive from the Lord. Why are visitations, manifestations, and demonstrations from the Holy Ghost so important in the time in which we live? Why is that so important? Let's allow the Apostle Paul to answer the question for us. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. The Amplified describes perilous times as times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. Times of great stress, hard to deal with and hard to bear. Then it goes on to say, now these are signs of the last days. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Then it goes on to say in verse 8, list a couple of guys here, and then in the latter part it says, they resist the truth, they are men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Now he says these are some of the characteristics of the last days. Let me read some of this from the message translation. As the end approaches, people are going to be self-absorbed, money hungry, self-promoting, stuck up, profane, contemptuous, uh, uh, contemptuous of parents, crude, coarse, dog eat dog, unbending, slanderous, impulsively wild, savage, cynical, treacherous, ruthless, bloated windbags. And listen to this, addicted to lust. Addicted to lust and allergic to God. <laughs> addicted to lust. <laughs> Does that sound like July 2015? Self-absorbed, unbending, savage, but that addicted to lust is what stood out to me. And then it goes on to say, twisted in their thinking, defying the truth. Now, folks, that's the kind of day we live in. Now, my question was, why are visitations, 
manifestations and demonstrations from the Holy Ghost so important in which the day we live. Because of these characteristics of the day in which we live. If you think just the preaching of good sermons alone is going to turn these people to God, you are very naive. Amen? Let me prove that to you from the same man who wrote that. Go to the next chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We've got to keep preaching good sermons. Keep preaching powerful sermons. But that alone is not going to turn the majority of this people to God. If it would, they'd already be turned to God. All they got to do is turn on their television and good sermons are going out 24-7. And some do. Some do. Some of these savage, <laughs> treacherous, addicted to lust people, they do hear the word and get saved. But the majority of these people is going to take more than just the preaching of the word. Look at Paul's writings in 2 Timothy 4 and 2. Well, let's, let's go ahead and read verse 1. Now, this is after he's giving us all these characteristics of the last days. Then he said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. So there he tells us, when you see characteristics like this in the earth, keep preaching the Word. Don't stop preaching the Word. Amen. We're not going to water down our doctrines, our message. We're not going to preach something that's acceptable socially or socially acceptable, politically correct. We're going to preach the Word. They may take our tax exempt. So what? We're going to preach the word. They're not pushing their agendas on my house. We're going to live by the word. We're going to preach the word. We're going to stand up for the word. Hallelujah. Paul said, when you see the world in this condition, this is not the time to stop preaching the Word. This is not the time to just get in agreement with them. This is not the time to conform to them. We don't become worldly to win the world. We preach the Word. Somebody shout, preach the Word. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. I take that to mean it may have a deeper meaning than this, but sometimes it may not be popular to preach the Word in some settings, but just go ahead and preach the Word. Amen? Be instant in season and out. Now, it doesn't end there. See, I, as ministers, sometimes that's where we stop reading. That's where we stop preaching. All right, brothers, we need to keep preaching the word. Preach the word, brother. Well, let's keep reading. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away or their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and right along with the preaching of the word, do the work of an evangelist. Preach the word, but right along with that, do the work of an evangelist. Well, let's take a look at what an evangelist does. Let's go to Acts chapter 21. Paul is traveling to Caesarea. Verse 8 says, 
and they came unto, the latter part, came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist. Now notice, the Bible makes it very clear the office in which Philip operated in. We were in the home of Philip the evangelist. So we know that's what he was. That was his calling. That's his office of ministry. But let's see what happens when Philip operates in the office of the evangelist. Go back to chapter 8. In verse 5. Then Philip, is this the same Philip? Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Notice he's preaching the word, but let's also remember he's an evangelist. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So apparently if you're going to do the work of an evangelist, there's got to be some miracles. Let me try this other side of the auditorium. They went to the house of Philip the evangelist. And then we see the evangelist at work and there were miracles and healings. Not only that, but unclean spirits crying out with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsies and that were lame and were healed and there was great joy in that city. Notice it didn't say, and there was great joy in that little church on the back side of the tracks. There was great joy in the city. The miracles, the healings, the deliverances impacted the entire city. That's what it's going to take to turn this generation to God. Well, Brother Jerry, I'm not called to be an evangelist. We're not talking about you being called to be an evangelist. We're talking about you doing what Paul said, regardless of what your office of ministry is. He said, preach the word. You're going to do that, aren't you, regardless of what your office is? But then right along with it, he said, and add to it, do the work of an evangelist. If all we're doing is preaching the word, then we haven't completed our assignment. That's part of it. That's a big part of it. But we're also to do the work of an evangelist. Notice this is all linked together with last days. In the last days, these are going to be the signs. Therefore, I charge you, preach the word and do the work of an evangelist. Why? Because it's going to take the work of an evangelist, the characteristics of an evangelist, the anointings, the giftings, the signs, the wonders, the miracles that are performed in an evangelist ministry to win this ungodly people in these last days. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Brother Hagin used to say that healing and miracles is the dinner bell. It's what attracts the people. Can you say amen? The message translation says, they saw the miracles and then the message translation describes the miracles as clear signs of God's action. I love that. Clear signs of God's action, or you could say God's power. Amen. Clear signs Amen. of God's power. Amen. In the book of Acts chapter 1, it talks about infallible proofs, Amen. notable miracles that no one could deny. Amen. 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 I uh, have shared with you over the years I'm not going to go into the story at great length, but years ago when Carol and I first got a hold of this from the Copelands, 1969, 
And the next time they came back to do another meeting is when our daughter Terry uh, had her fingers cut off in the nursery. These two fingers right here, right behind the fingertips. And when we took her to the doctor, I gave him those little fingertips and he looked at them, examined them and threw them in the, cat, uh, in the, in the trash and said, there's nothing I can do with those. I can only take a skin graft, take a piece of skin from her hip and do a skin graft, cover them up, and they'll never be normal, never be the right length, never have nails, so forth. Well, we'd, we'd been, you know, we'd, we'd been in this faith thing for about six months now. And man, I'm telling you, I, I had what T.L. Osborne used to refer to as young faith. <laughs> young faith. It means it hadn't been to church yet and learned to doubt. <laughs> you know, when you first get saved, you just, you just believe God can do anything until you go to church and find out he don't do that anymore. You know, well, we hadn't, we hadn't found that out. And so, man, our, our faith, I mean, man, I'm listening to these tapes night and day and my faith is higher than a Georgia pine tree. So I said to the doctor, even though, you know, this is a highly educated man at the top of his profession. And they told us when we went in, he's the top plastic surgeon in the state of Louisiana. If anybody can reattach these fingertips, it'd be him. Well, he said he couldn't. The nerve was dead. The tissue was dead. And he threw them away. And um, so he tells us that they'll never be normal. They'll never be the right length. Never have nails. Just be two little nubs. Now, Terry is about, what, 13 months old? Somewhere along in there. And um, so we, we would not receive that. And so I said to him, I said, sir, uh, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I appreciate your education and your dedication to the medical field, but my God will restore my baby's Amen. fingers. Amen. He said, that's impossible. Now, this man served Buddha. He had Buddha statues all over his office. See, these kind of things are impossible to his God. That's right. That's right. But Buddha's not my God. That's right. Now, he's basing this on his medical training and apparently on his spiritual involvement with Buddha because Buddha don't restore Amen. That's right. fingers. That's right. Amen. You know, look like to me, the only thing Buddha does is get fatter and fatter. And yeah. Yeah. I don't understand why anybody wants to serve anything to look like that anyway. But anyway. So I said, sir, I, I'm sorry, but I don't receive that. My God will restore my baby's fingers. He said, that's impossible. I said, with your God, but not my God. He went over to Carolyn and said, your, your husband, <laughs> what was his words? Uh, yeah, your husband's in shock or something like that. And said, he don't understand. This is medically impossible. She said, no, sir, it's you that don't understand. Our God will restore our baby's fingers. Well, he kept saying impossible, impossible, impossible. So finally, I told him, I said, you do what you know to do. You take it as far as medical science can take it, and God will do the rest. Now, you, we couldn't take her home, leaving that all exposed. So he took the skin graft and kept her overnight. And... Uh, Carolyn stayed in the hospital with us, with her. Brother Copeland had one more service. I said, Carolyn, I'm going to go get in that service and listen to Brother Copeland because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, and I'll come back just as soon as that service is over, and then I'll preach to you word for word everything I heard him say. Amen. So we're, our faith will be on the same level. Amen. Okay? Amen. So we, he told us to take her home and then come back six weeks, so forth. But anyway, the story ends up like this. When he cuts the bandages off for the final time and lifts his hands and says, my God, I said, what is it, doc? He said, look, the fingers are back. The nails are on them. They're normal. You can't even tell they'd ever been cut off. Other than a little scar under each nail. And when he said, my God, and I saw what he 
what caused him to say that. I looked at him and I said, no, sir, not your God, my God. Amen. Amen. Now, I could have preached to that man all day long, and he could have just ignored what I said, or he could have been gracious and said, yes, 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 and then just walk away not believing a thing I said. But a miracle. I said, but a miracle. In fact, he asked me, he was so impressed. I don't know what the bill would have been, what he would have charged for whatever he did, but he said, I'm only going to charge you for the bandages, and I think my bill was $14. Wow. It impressed him so. And then he said, I'm going to, I believe it was either Baton Rouge or New Orleans, this week, and I'm the keynote speaker to all of my colleagues. Do you mind if I tell them what I saw here because I think it'll impress them like it impressed me? I said, help yourself. <laughs> He's going to go talk to a house full of doctors about something God did that medicine couldn't do. He went home and told his wife, who also, I assume, served Buddha, but it made such an impact on her that a few days later, she was in a hair salon having her hair done, and she just couldn't hold it back anymore. She said, I just, I don't know if you believe in this to the hairdresser, but I got to tell you something my husband told me. She didn't know that the hairdresser was a lady that came to our Bible study every Monday night <laughs> and knew the story. Believe God with us while, while we was waiting for the manifestation. And she said, I'm telling you, this, this, I can't quit thinking about what happened to that little girl and, and them talking about their God would restore. She got saved over it, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know if I've even told Carolyn or Terry or Jerry about this, but here not too long ago when we were in Shreveport and I was preaching at Life Tabernacle's 70. Fifth anniversary, a person came up to me, I don't think I told you guys, and said, Brother Jerry, you remember the doctor that did the, the skin graft on, on Terry's fingers? I said, oh yeah, I'll never forget him. He said, well, we just want you to know he's still telling that story and he's saved now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Notice. A visitation, a manifestation, a demonstration from the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. You know what that makes me think? How many other people that are serving Buddha today are not going to be serving him too much longer when they see visitations, demonstrations, and manifestations of the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord another shout. Give him your best shout, hallelujah. They saw the miracles, the clear signs of God's action. They couldn't deny that it was God. Can you say amen? The signs and the wonders and the miracles is what will get their attention. Hallelujah. You notice that once Philip preached the word and then they saw the miracles that were performed. The message translation says, after that, they hung on to every word. Amen. They couldn't get enough. Amen. They hung on to every word. Amen. Praise God. Did you notice that once Philip preached Christ, what happened? Signs wonders, and miracles. And notice it got the attention of the entire city. That's what we need today. We need moves of God to take place all over our nation, all over the world, that will get the attention of people that perhaps wouldn't listen to the Word alone. We never stop preaching the Word. The Apostle Paul tells us we must preach the Word. But folks, we need signs, wonders, and miracles to go along with it so that people can see that our God is alive, that Jesus is alive, and that He is indeed Lord of all. So, 
I want you to join your faith with mine. I'm believing that everywhere I go, I'm not just going to have services anymore, but encounters with God. I want you to come and be in those services. Also, I want to remind you that our special offer, my book entitled Every Day a Blessing Day, and three CDs entitled Provision for Your Vision. Do you have a vision from God? Would you like to know how that you can position yourself to have it financed? I want you to know that God has made certain promises that once he gives a vision where he guides, he will provide. Powerful tools. In fact, I want you to watch our announcer as he shares with you this message about how you can order these products and get them into your home. Thank you for watching today. God bless you. It is God's desire that you walk in his blessing every day. In the book, Every Day a Blessing Day, Jerry Savelle reveals what the blessing of God is and how this supernatural empowerment is designed to make you prosper and excel. When the world says downsize and decrease, you can rise above. You can experience the joy and freedom that come from making every day a blessing day. In the three CD series, Provision for Your Vision, Jerry Savelle shares God-given wisdom on carrying out vision. In this message, you will learn how to know your vision is from God, why God only entrusts his vision to the vision visionary, how God will provide for you to carry out his vision, the biblical checklist for receiving your harvest, the possible stumbling blocks to receiving the provision, and much more. Don't wait. Request this visionary package including Every Day a Blessing Day and provision for your vision. Call or go online to jerrysavelle.org. Gain the understanding you need to apply the power of God's blessing and carry out your vision today. Don't forget to order these products. This is an important series of messages on CD and the book, Every Day of Blessing Day. You know, the Bible says that God promises that he will daily load us with benefits. Wow. Can you imagine that? Living in the blessing of God every day of your life. And then one of the things you're going to learn on these CDs on provision for your vision is number one, how can you know that your vision is from God? That's important. Do you truly believe your vision is from God? If you do, then you're going to find out how that God has promised that he will provide for that vision and bring it to pass if you just apply the principles that you'll learn from this series. Also, I want to thank our partners. You're such a blessing to us. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for your confidence and the call of God on my life. And thank you for helping us to expand this ministry to other parts of the world. We appreciate you. We love you. We pray for you. And we believe the same anointing, the same favor, and the same grace that's on this ministry is on you. Bless you. And we'll see you next week.